It's Josh and Frankie with a couple of dumb shits. Hello, primates. You found Primus Tracks. Congratulations. There are many places to find us, not just here. We are at Primus Tracks on Instagram and threads. Primus Tracks pod at gmail.com is the email address. And there is a Facebook page run uh, by one of the hosts of this podcast. Speaking of, I'm one of them. I'm Josh. And the guy that runs the Facebook page is Frankie. Hey, Josh. All the way from the 39th floor of Primus Tracks Towers in Mexico City. Good to see you, pal. Hello. Good to see you, Josh. You are no longer Euro Josh now. Yes, I am back from my European vacation or my Euro trip. I did not befall any sophomoric hijinks. This podcast is not about my gallivanting around the universe, Frankie. It's about Primus and associated musical acts. And that brings me to the topic for today. We are talking about David McAllister 2 from the Les Claypool Frog Brigade record Purple Onion. We are nearing the end of this hallowed record from 2002, Frankie. And uh, we're, we're, we're listening to a sequel. We've heard David McAllister 1. Uh, and now we're coming around to the song sequel. So, of course, my opening question for you is, what's your favorite pair of... Uh, songs that have a part one and a part two attached to them and you can't pick the fisherman's chronicles <laughs> i absolutely love cricket and the genie parts one and two and i love how that got revisited on south of reality and it makes me very curious if they're actually going to carry on with the cricket chronicles on the third delirium album because then the cricket chronicles would be the Claypool Lennon equivalent to the Fisherman Chronicles with Primus. Oh, that's true. They're uh, they're on their way already. Yep. In such a short time, uh, I guess the first one that comes to mind is "Move Me" parts one and two uh, by King's X. I really enjoy those tunes. I and I have to ask: is there a, is there a pair of Bowie songs that have a uh, part one and two? There's a really great Bowie track called Untitled Number One on the Boot Up Suburbia album from 1993. <laughs> and a lot of people thought that it was part one of something else. But it turns out that Bowie titled the song like an impressionistic painting. We do have some miscellaneous debris, so we uh, I should probably press the button for that. Ah, that sound means we have miscellaneous debris. Frankie, you're bringing it today, so strew it around. What do you have for miscellaneous debris? The three men of extreme power are currently on tour, and they have dusted off not one, but two rarities. So first, they left us speechless with the triumphant return of My Friend Fats into the sets. And now we are all collectively losing our minds as they have premiered You Like It, which have not been performed yeah. since Columbus 2004, Hallucinogenetics Tour. And we know how Les felt about the lyrics, and we know they had rehearsed it and dropped it on previous occasions. So it's pretty much a miracle that it has now been brought back into official rotation. Two tunes that have not seen the light of day in a live setting for 20 years now becoming regulars on the tour, question mark? Pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm glad, of course, yes. that they are digging uh, back through the catalog and finding uh, stuff to play they haven't played in a long time because I would, I would assume that makes things a bit fresher for them as well. That's great. This is something that the Primus will do every time they tour. They don't necessarily promote a new album, but they dust off a rarity or two to make each tour interesting. Of course, you remember how the summer 2018 tour with Mastodon had Intruder right. in the sets. I figure now they do that. Uh, I figure they do that every time, Frankie, just to appease you. Yes, <laughs> most likely. It keeps you from uh, writing angry letters. You know, <laughs> in they're... 2017. They had a spring tour, and 
they began performing on the tweak again during the sets. That's so, right. Yes, it's it's a primus thing. There will be a rarity or two in every tour. <laughs> Keep them coming, guys. Love those rarities. I think it's time for us to talk about today's track, Frankie. The excrement has hit the air conditioning. It's David McAllister <laughs> 2. Uh, this one checks in. It's 7 minutes and 25 seconds. Wow. The penultimate track on the album. Credits as follows, Les Claypool on bass and vocals, Dean Johnson on drums, Enor on slide guitar, Mike D on marimba, and Skerrick on fancy sax. Premiered on April 18, 2002 in Seattle, Washington. It was performed less than its counterpart, McAllister 1, but still enjoyed rotation throughout 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2005. The Fancy Band premiered the song on October 9, 2005 in Urbana. Illinois, right after McAllister 1. It would only be played 10 more times by the fancy band before being resurrected on hmm. th- uh, sorry, in 2009 at St. Petersburg by the Fungi Band. It would only be played five more times after that, making it a rare number for the Fungi Band. I wouldn't call it a rare number per se because it was performed 15 times the last year by the Frog Brigade in the 2023 comeback tour and we most highlight the fact that shiner particularly loved playing macalester one and macalester two back to back maybe he's the linchpin of these parts one and two uh songs the it's a the... prop tradition yeah you know how how uh sean lennon introduced les claypool to the flower traveling band yeah satori is also actually called satori part one so the song actually has many other parts on the record. So these segmented songs might be a Sean Lennon special, but here it's we a have a Shiner one. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but here we have a part two, uh, way back in 2002. Of course, most of our stats are courtesy of Toasterland. I have 259 live performances for Mac 1 and only 92 for Mac Alaster part two. That's a large disparity, Frankie. Totally. Uh, McAllister 2, a bit more plotting, which may uh, be a part of it, uh, but it also might be a chore to play, given its uh, length. And some of the vocals are pretty out there, even for a Les Claypool record. (laughs) I should also mention and credit our fellow primate, Ellen, who replied to our Instagram post for McAllister 1 and uh, suggested that Dave McElhatton who was a radio and TV broadcaster in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area for decades, uh, was the inspiration for the name David McAllister. And I have to imagine that is no coincidence. So no, that was that was absolutely new information to me. Uh, McElhatton had quite a long and distinguished TV news career in the Bay Area. So uh, Les definitely would have seen that guy on TV quite a bit when he was catching up on the news. I would assume it's just the name. He he just changed the name a little bit uh, to kind of fit the narrative. I don't think he's actually commenting on Dave McElhatton specifically. I think this is more a generalized thing. He's just using the name. Of course, uh, McAllister 1 is bright. It's bouncy. It's in a major key. It's a happy little song, Frankie. McAllister 2 is the dark military march version of that. There's similar melodies, uh, it's transpo- but it's transposed to a minor key, and the tempo is much slower and, uh, like I said, plotting, but also pulsing. Uh, this one is quite interesting to me, and as you reminded me, I said it's one of my favorite tracks on the record, uh, and so uh, I kind of want to mine that territory today uh, from a musical as well as a lyrical standpoint. Uh, I'm going to play the intro because to, to me, Frankie, uh, it sound, first of all, to me, it just sounds like a diesel engine trying to get started on one of those giant rigs uh, before it finally kicks into gear, and then we're off and, we're off and plodding. engine's going to turn over eventually. There we go. (laughs) 
I really like how they uh, draw out this introduction and give us a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then it finally, uh, around forty seconds or so, is is uh, at full speed here. Pretty heavy. Totally. And uh, I really like the interplay, especially of the guitar and marimba uh, happening there. Les is playing like four notes and he's got he's got some delay on there. You know, he's not doing anything wacky or out of the ordinary, but he's laying a nice foundation there in that uh, with that upright. I'm going to forward to the first verse here, Frankie, and say this might be my favorite opening lyric uh, of a song that is vocalized by Les Claypool. Not something I think about often, but listening to this tune again today, this first line is so engaging in consideration for David McAllister 1 and coming back around to David McAllister 2 uh, and the delivery of this line, it might be my favorite. I'm David McAllister, your 10 o'clock newscaster and- Shit has just hit the fan. <laughs> it's great. Uh, he uses that colloquialism. The shit has just hit the fan. It's a really great delivery. Uh, and of course, we're contrasting now uh, Mac 1 and 2. So the idea, of course, that Mac 2 is kind of the big, uh, scary brother of Mac 1 um, is fully realized at this point. And I do remember... Uh, when I first listened to Purple Onion 20 odd years ago, that I uh, I was immediately drawn to this track uh, because of that contrast, and I think because of that, uh, you know, the 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 bit of sludginess we get to this one, and kind of the heaviness, and it builds. It keeps the same pace, but it builds on itself, uh, and then we get to a really, uh, really catchy and really engaging chorus that sounds like this. <laughs> A lot of great stuff there, uh, especially with the vocals. He's hitting some notes. Of course, he's uh, got the two uh, main vocal tracks there, and we get my favorite thing, Hoo! which is always uh, a groin-grabbing <laughs> moment uh, at, at a live show or on a track like this. But these vocals, of course, are more sinister, uh, even though they follow a similar pattern to Mac 1, and I, it's just rolling right along. This one doesn't feel like a seven and a half minute track uh, until about the last minute. It kind of it kind of just rolls right along for me. Uh, but what are you hearing in this track that's uh, attracting your attention? That is much more sinister than part one. You like the sinister music, I suppose, from time to time. I like sinister stuff, so I, I really enjoy it. Um, I mean, Macalester 1 has this very playful aspect to it. It's very upbeat. I mean, we know that the lyrics are completely sarcastic, but the <laughs> music is, you know, is... How can I describe it? I would say that it's one of the most <laughs> joyful tracks on the record, right? Yeah. And now Macalester 2 is the perfect counterpart because you have essentially the same song with some variation on the lyrics, but... It's interesting because it's nothing like McAllister 1. There's something I want to connect here, but it's specifically to McAllister 2. And as you know, Frankie, Les Claypool's favorite movie is? How I Learned to Relax and Love the Bomb. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to play, I want to play this part because I hear parallels to Dr. Strangelove, particularly 
uh, anytime Major Kong is on screen. I want to play the Major Kong theme song, which many will recognize as uh, the ants go marching, which is uh, a fairly maybe still well known. I don't I don't know, but I remember hearing it as a kid, a nursery rhyme type song. Let's see what we hear as far as similarities between this uh, and Mac 2. Target distance, seven miles. Correct track indicator, minus seven. Roger, seven miles. Back to GPI and acceleration factor. GPI acceleration factor set. I also forgot that James Earl Jones was in that film. You hear that march. You hear that drum beat. It's quite similar to what we hear in Mac 2. It's not exact. Um, and I don't know if he's paying homage here with Mac 2, but it certainly sounds that way to me uh, with this march uh, that we get in Mac 2. And it's certainly not derivative of that melody either for for the ants go marching. But uh, there's something else that he does uh, on this track that reminds me of Strange Love. So here's this. So he, he gives us that, that vocal flourish there, I suppose, and then later on he repeats it again, and then we get a little bit of this uh, on the other end of it. So we get that you who and the 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 maniacal laughter. It just reminds me of probably the most well known moment of Strange Love. <laughs> As Kong rides the bomb. It could be coincidence, but I, I feel like there's a connection there. Definitely. I, that's okay. a, that's a really amazing parallel that you made. Are you buying that connection? I'm totally buying it. I'm sold. Buy it. Buy it. Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes sense to me, uh, given he's stated this is his favorite film, and he's he draws inspiration from what he knows, and he certainly knows this film. Moving along, uh, of course, we get some Skerrick and Enor spotlights uh, throughout the tune, and then the vocals get raspier i didn't know that he could get so raspy uh but a little after the four minute mark uh this portion in particular um he's really reaching for it if i were only 10 years younger i'd slake this vengeful hunger and rest assured we'd all sleep safe tonight tonight I love that chorus, by the way. It's a it's a bummer I'm talking over it because I just want to let it play. But you guys have all heard this song. Uh, so I really love the delivery there on the verse and then this uh, chorus that's playing right now, those elongated uh, words are a lot of fun to sing. It's a, it's a catchy one, Frankie, for being so dirgy and dark. Then it starts meandering after the five-minute mark, Frankie, and then uh, near uh, around the last minute is where we really get some of our marching ants and some bastardized yo-hos and that sort of thing. Some fun drum work from uh, Steamy Dean there, too, uh, to round this out. Now, when you're singing the song, Frankie, and I know you hum it to yourself, if you're not, uh, what's, I know you are. We'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, when you're singing it to yourself, Frankie, that last part, are you doing the... 
Yeah. Or are you doing the more subtle hum part? Because I love doing the hum part. So no, if, if you want to do the other part, we can start our uh, barbershop duet. <laughs> I'm always doing the first one. That's a, that's a really short summary of uh, the highlights for me, Frankie. Both Macalaster 1 and 2 are kind of one note. And what I mean by that is they, they, they stick to the mission. They don't deviate. They've uh, they've got their specific parts, I th- and of course that's by design because Mac One has to sound the way it does for Mac Two to make any kind of difference or have any kind of resonance, uh, and they're meant to contrast one another, um, and largely within I should say largely the same structure. Uh, I you know Mac Two could be shorter, but it certainly to me needs to sound bigger and more of a mini epic uh, than Mac One with its yeah. bouncy naivety, I guess, given the lyrics. Uh, and then reflect, uh, it's got to reflect this sudden turn to, I suppose, uh, belligerence, given the lyrics um, and the marching beat that we have driving this one. And so this, uh, yeah, this one ranks really high for me, Frankie. It's funny, I, I, I'll listen to Mac 1 and 2 back to back, like our pal Shiner, uh, but I think I gravitate to- more towards Mac 2 on the whole, although Mac 1 certainly is catchy in its own right. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's not a contest, but I think, I'd, uh, I think I'm on Team Mac 2 here. It's okay, but I prefer 1. <laughs> it's good to celebrate our differences, Frankie. You get the one that's been performed more live, too. <laughs> Lucky guy. With the lyrics, Frankie, uh, Claypool establishes a similar lyrical structure with the uh, I'm David McAllister, your 10 o'clock newscaster. Good evening, and here's what's new. Uh, with the chorus and the idea of dreams, the dreams that make you happy and smile, and the idea of blank is back in style. So in the first one, apathy was back in style. This time it's vengeance. All these sentiments are in the opposite direction. Uh, because when he says the shit has hit the fan, clearly this is about 9-11, uh, which was at the time a recent event. The other thing I caught from this, Frankie, is that the media figure, the fictional McAllister, is telling you how to feel in both of them. He's he's telling you that uh, you should feel apathy in the first song. And then this time he's saying, I'm going to show you things that are going to fill you with rage and you should go fight as a result of it. Uh, And so once again, we're being told how to feel as opposed to being given information that we can process and do something with and then come to our own conclusions that may or may not be uh, punctuated by emotion. Having experienced 9-11, as I did, Frankie, from my dorm room in uh, Iowa City, Iowa, uh, vengeance certainly was the flavor of the news so quickly uh, after the event. Uh, in this country. And I also recall uh, guys on my, uh, some of the guys on my floor there, Frankie, were within hours were saying, let's go kill all the bastards, you know? And I was like, what are you, do you even know who you're talking about? What is going on? Because the, the news coverage, it wasn't an examination of how we got to that point and why it happened. It was this thing happened and now it's time to kick ass. It, it, you know, the, the questioning didn't last very long in the mainstream media. And so, and that's where I got stuck. I was trying to figure out why did this happen and what can we do maybe so that this doesn't happen again? Uh, our, our country went in one direction with that, not the direction I wanted it to go. So be it. Uh, and I think that's also the source of the uh, frustrations that Les is airing in Mac 1 and 2. Uh, that we're being told how to feel, and not just as a result of this traumatic event, but beforehand, too, we were being um, fed uh, the news, essentially, uh, and what we were supposed to think of it with it, as opposed to being able to draw our own conclusions. This narrative between Mac 1 and 2, that everything is hunky-dory, which of course it actually isn't, uh, and turned on a dime in which the media was a mouthpiece for the administration uh, to do what it did. 
uh, in many different aspects, both foreign and domestic. And of course, they oversimplified the issue, Frankie. Of course, geopolitics is really complicated. Uh, but what happened in the media uh, following those events was oversimplified. Uh, and so in retrospect, it was a weird time. It was a weird experience, but also it was an indicative experience of what was to come, uh, which I, I call the nauseating oversaturation and sensationalism uh, that we endure now. It's tough out there, Frankie. Yeah, that's that makes perfect sense in terms of the time frame and all the inspiration behind the track. Now, my personal connection mm -hmm. to Mac Laster 2 is totally different. This song always reminds me of a, a really, really fascinating case, which I think could basically be regarded as one of the all-time holy grails of lost media, the case of Christine Chubbuck. Have you heard about her? Christine was a newscaster in Florida. Um, she had a show uh, in the mornings, and she was pushing hard to broadcast social interest stories. But the news station kept insisting that she reported what she described as blood and guts. So they wanted sensational uh, pieces. They wanted her to cover the most graphic and most violent news possible. Oh. And then one day she made history by committing the first live suicide on TV. Oh, okay. Yes, I have heard of this. Yes, the tape was considered lost for decades. This happened back in 1974 until it was confirmed as existing in 2016 by the widow of the owner of the news station. Oh, wow. Yes, this is a lost media holy grail. And the lyrics always remind me of, of that case. What what do you think is the the connection for you with these lyrics? Is it that that idea that uh, this that Macalester is pushing blood and guts essentially, and and uh, yes, the yeah. the sensationalism, yeah. And it was it was hard to avoid uh, after nine eleven, of course, because there was uh, just so much information and misinformation, and. I think ev uh, so many people were trying to get as much information as they could uh, that they weren't uh, being discriminant about what they what they consumed. And that messed up the narrative. It messed up perceptions of what was actually happening uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but to to hear that in you know from 1974 is one at the same time it's surprising but not surprising uh, because we know what generates ratings we know what uh, gets eyeballs to televisions we knows we know what sells newspapers and that sort of thing and it's the blood and guts and the sensationalism it's not those in-depth uh, social pieces or think pieces uh, that that may actually spur positive action. Uh, and of course, that's uh, that's been a long time criticism of mainstream and popular media, and it remains uh, to this day in similar form. That's an interesting connection that you make, Frankie, because it is also a commentary on the nature of media itself and what it can drive uh, people to do. And that reminds me, that, just, that actually takes me back to Mac 1, about my my liver that lyric my liver's on the mend right so uh there is there's probably a lot of stress working in media as well especially when your editor or the billionaire owner of the conglomerate corporation that uh owns your station says no no we need this <laughs> and it goes against all your journalistic instincts and integrity uh it's it's a troublesome landscape in that arena, and it, it's really hard to navigate. Um, and I'll tell you, as a public educator, that's the thing I'm most trying to impress upon the kids is you have to think critically about this. You have to ask questions and evaluate what's being said and the sources 
uh, that they're coming from so that you can make an informed decision. Um, Because it's really easy just to listen to some commentator on TikTok or something and go, look what I heard. And then, and that's it. All of a, you know, all of a sudden you're listening to something, you know, listening to someone who may not be a reliable source. Uh, so Les is really raising important issues here. And, uh, you know, he, this isn't the first time he's expressed frustration with media and it won't be the last in his lyrics. Uh, uh, it be, does become a common theme across the spectrum, right? There's Primus lyrics, Bernie Brain's lyrics, Frog Brigade lyrics, uh, Claypool Lennon delirium lyrics that are critical of media, media in all forms. This one's kind of a downer, Frankie. I'm feeling, I'm feeling sad. The good thing is that it's followed by one of the most upbeat creations in the Les Claypool solo, solo catalog. That's true, and I wanted to ask you about track placement because usually uh, a Primus or a Claypool related album will have a closing track that reprises. Uh, an opening track or the first legit song on the album. I have a feeling Les didn't want to end the record with Mac 2. Uh, that's precisely what I was going to say. <laughs> I don't think Les wanted to end the album on this note. To end it on such an ominous note, I think, would be uh, awkward, and it just doesn't seem natural. And so uh, as far as placing it, as the penultimate track, it still serves the purpose of bookending the record, uh, but then we get to end it with Cosmic Highway, which uh, puts us in a different frame of mind to end proceedings, and probably a, a more positive state of mind. I don't think that's out of left field to say. The song you're hearing right now is by Johnny Perona, one of our primates, primatrons over at uh, patreon.com forward slash primus tracks. Uh, you can go there, uh, support Josh and Frankie, and see all the different tiers of membership and benefits and so on and so forth. The universal one is that I put up the track up for discussion, and you uh, get to contribute to the show with your takes on it. Let's start with John Shreve on the Primates Takes for Macalester 2, who says, This is proof of this poor man's anger and mental health issues. I remember seeing it twice live, and they drug it out too long. When I hear it, I can see Skerrick in my head doing the he in his devil helmet thing. <laughs> So John, uh, John says that they drag on too long live, Frankie. And you've, uh, when we get to the live cuts, we have two cuts that are near twelve minutes. Um, yeah, I can see where my Perona is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was John Shreve. I don't think my Perona got to this one yet, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, let's go to our landed gentry. Edwin Allen Richards IV says, D- uh, Macalester II is the beautifully negative counterpart to Mac One. It's perfectly placed so much later in the album that the listener has gone on such a journey to get there and everything has gotten much darker. An interesting second track to second to last track bookend. Uh, and yeah, and to look at the last uh, three tracks that we've discussed, Frankie, uh, lights in the sky, pretty dark tone. Up on the roof, lyrically dark for sure. Yeah. Uh, and now Macalester Two kind of wraps up the triumvirate of tracks that are that are fairly uh dark. Let's wrap it up with Brooks Delight, Frankie, who says dark, eerie, menacing. Brooks broke it down beautifully. He actually goes on to say, "I've often wondered if this one started." Uh, life as an end of the album reprise something along the lines of Los Bastardos to defy Salmon Men. It has all the characteristics. We kind of touched on that. I would be interested to know if uh, parts one and two were by design or if part two was going to just be kind of that yo hoing that we get in the last minute and maybe that was going to be the album outro. I really, I really think it was one and two by design the whole time. I think he had that idea and wanted to show that contrast. Interesting idea, though. You know, uh, a one-minute Mac 2 reprise even after Cosmic Highway wouldn't have been out of bounds. And it would have been the 13th track. 
13 seems to be a pretty common number when it comes to the tracks on Primus and Claypool albums. Thank you, primates and primatrons, for your takes. Now it's time. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. The gem vehicle. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. A true jam vehicle. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. The jam vehicle. Live cuts. What's going on here? Shards of bone in my anus. <laughs> you know, I want to make a short version of that, Frankie, but I can't bring myself to do it. It is perfect, Assis. <laughs> All right, live cuts today. Hey, we're going back to Burlington. The Ira Allen Chapel, 2002. Let's hear what they were up to that night. This one uh, clearly is a Frankie favorite, so let's hear uh, how they did Mac 2 at the chapel. Ooh, you took us right to the Yo-Ho's of the yeah. how spacey that is in the in that live setting that sounds great and uh credit to those guys for doing the vocals it was enor and somebody uh and they sounded great it it is a great show great recording too i'm glad you keep bringing it back let's go to the fillmore san francisco 2002 i think we've been to this show a couple of times uh along along the way with purple onion we're gonna hear a few parts of mac 2 in the hometown. Here we go! drum in there he's hitting that snare drum with such disdain <laughs> i love the sound of that <laughs> gosh it sounds nice and sinister live let's hear a ski rack Yes. It is no, but you know what? It is it is not uh Jay, it's Paolo. Oh, that's Paolo. Well he's that's hitting Paolo. the he's hitting that snare with such yeah. disdain in that first let's uh let's move to the end with the drum outro. I hear this uh rendition of that. Ten wow, ten minutes and twenty seconds. It's actually not that much longer than the studio cut, so you're <laughs> you're really not extending it uh by that much to do a twelve minute Mac two. Yeah. 
<laughs> Paolo brings it home there. That was a fantastic drum section, right? I enjoyed that very much. That was a great way to bring it home because, of course, uh, it fades out more or less on the record. I, I mentioned the Ansco Marching, uh, which is the, the song uh, that we hear in Strange Love when Major Kong is around. Um, that tune is actually based on a tune from the American Civil War uh, called When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Uh, when we have that drum beat and hearing it there, especially on that live cut, as the drums uh, kind of become isolated there, but Paolo continues that marching uh, drum beat, kind of reminds me of that, right? So, you know, the, you march off to war, you march home from war. So it, it just kind of gives that um, extra imagery, you know, kind of Macalaster yelling through a megaphone and uh, people marching off to war as a result or going to do horrendous things to somebody else. Um, as a result of his exhortations. So, what a dark tune, man. I could ruminate in on it for quite some time. And I already have. Any final thoughts on this one, Frankie? I mean, it does rank up there for me, despite uh, despite its mood. Um, and I and I just think it's it's the message, it's the music, it's the overall vibe. I like it a lot. Final thought, it was a very clever idea to create the song as a counterpart to McAllister 1 so that the album carries the Primus tradition of having a reprise of one of the tracks. Um, it also offers you know, interesting variety. Maybe sometimes you're in the mood to reach for this one. Maybe sometimes you're in the mood to play McAllister 1. Maybe sometime you're in the mood to play both. So it's nice to have both versions available. So I guess I can say this, McAllister 2, cut to commercial, because you've been tracked. Next time, Frankie, we're taking this jam vehicle on the Cosmic Highway. With a very special guest. Yeah, he's in the trunk. We'll let him out at the next rest stop. Primates, thank you so much for listening. Primatrons, supporters of all things Primus Tracks. Uh, thanks for putting up with us. Later days. Willie Mace.